Howdy, folks, and welcome to episode 483 of the Dev Robot Society. I'm Paul E. Cooley, and joining me today is my regular co-host and antagonizer, uh, antag personal antagonist, but not, you know, not my, uh, not my enemy, Mr. Terry Mixon. Jake Bible is your nemesis, so I can't exactly fill in that void. No, you can't. Jake, Jake just, you know, and the other thing is, I'm not sure I want that because I have to see you every week. The best thing about Jake Bible is we never met in person. You know, that, no, that is the fix that we're going to have to fix that. I I'm serious. If, if we both meet at con Carolina or whatever the hell or dragon con or, or Balticon or wherever it's, it's going to be, there's going to be sparks. There's going to be beatings <laughs> and there will be lots. <laughs> and there will be lots of drinking at the bar. <laughs> That's what I could tell you. <laughs> I'd love, I'd love to, I'd love to sit down with Jake and see him in person, shake his hand. Give him a hug and then punch him. <laughs> and I'm sure he feels the same way. <laughs> Enough of that. What's going on with you? Oh, just the writing. The Terra Gambit is finished. It's published. It's out there. So, so, so glad to get that out the door. And now I've already started writing on Tree of Liberty. So, not Tree of Liberty, um, Blood of Patriots. Blood of Patriots. So the next book is in progress. I've got to get it done by April 1st. Mm. The mm. deadline is here. Yeah, I'll, I'll be, I always wanted to put, I think I've only put out one book on, on April Fool's Day. And I, I try and stay away from that because that's usually Sigler Ascension Day. Well, um, I'm not putting it out, but I have to at least finish writing because finish, that's yeah. the day I need to start writing on uh, the next Glenn book. Gotcha. So I've got a deadline to finish blood, get it done, get her out there to start the editing process. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can see that. I can see that. Uh, and, and nothing else in, of interest, huh? Apart from the fact that you're now uh, thinking about uh, all the things that you're going to brainstorm, your personal self, all the other different ideas you've and epiphanies you've had over the last seven days. No, I haven't had any epiphanies. I'm just and so boring. No epiphanies. This is terrible. Well, after now that day job hell is over, and uh, that's why I look so freaking exhausted and, and still really stupid. Uh, I've been sleep deprived for about a five days now. You gotta love death marches. Now that that's over, I sat down and, and, uh, had a moment where a moment I was just going to look at some texts that I written to remember what the, the story was. And then I started just writing and for the first time in like a week, because I've been so focused on this other stuff. And then it, it, uh, it just kicked on. Next thing I knew 40 minutes had passed and I had 1200 words and I was just kind of sitting there going, what had, what the hell happened? And I would have happily kept going if not interrupted by the, that, by my wife saying dinner, dinner, dinner now. So it was, uh, and then I, I came back to it last night and wrote another, you know, seven or 800 words without batting an eye and would have kept going if not for the dog. <laughs> So it's, it's, uh, things are moving with, uh, Trident, the next derelict book already. And because everybody is badgering me about the black, I'm starting to put the outline together for that book as well. And I'm also, Whoa, hold on here. Hold on. You're actually going to do the black book. I figured that was a myth at this point. No, it's not a myth. It's not a myth. I just need to do it. I need to get evolution done. I need to, to uh, I just need to do it and you get evolution done. So I need to get that out there because y'all are screaming for it and I'll figure out a way to make it entertaining. I'll figure out a way. I just don't want it to be a rehash of the first three books. So I have to figure out uh, how I'm going to handle one problem. But once I'm after that, I, I, I'll, I'll be good to go, I think. So we'll see. Oh, the, you know, the, the big thing is I need the black to do something it's never done before. And I have a couple of allow, ideas. Allow people to live. No, that's not no no no. That's that's not that's not going to happen. <laughs> that's not coming. I already know what's going to happen in Extinction. I I just don't know if that's going to be the last book in the series or not. But uh, uh it, it 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 will happen. It will happen. I'll, I'll I'm I'm starting to put it together. I just need to now now I now I've got a couple more books under my belt. I think I can do it. 
just needs to be another challenge. So yes, I'm getting more and more excited about Trident. I'm getting more and more excited about the idea of doing the black. Quantum personality disorder is kind of off to the side right now because it's still an unknown quantity, but I need to get two good selling books out there. So this is what I need to focus on, which I guess is also why I haven't finished recording Gears Inferno. It's just kind of like, yeah, it's going to bring in a couple hundred bucks over its lifespan. Why bother? But uh, I'll bother for the podcast. That's why. So the uh, um, this will be this is gonna be fun if I can. February was a total write off, I think, for both of us in a lot of ways, and uh, March is shaping up to be um, pretty goddamn productive. So I'm really looking forward to getting through this month. Good deal, man. Good deal. Yeah, it's fun when you want to stay up because you want to write. It's 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 one of the wonderful things when the story is talking to you, the characters are babbling incessantly. And your brain is just coming up with new ways to torture them. That is just, that is when I just have so much fun as a writer. Uh, you know, the rest of it's work. That part of it is just so much fun. And, and, and uh, it's why, it's why we do it. You know, all the other shit is what you're paying for. This part is for us. <laughs> anyway that notwithstanding uh i guess we should probably cut this short and get into today's episode what do you think you know i think that's true because this episode is promising to be one that meanders all over the place oh my god yeah it's bad and today is when we recorded a few minutes ago wasn't too much better in fact it was worse <laughs> much worse I, I do have one more thing to say, which is we did put up a poll or excuse me, two posts today on the on the listeners Facebook group, as well as the um, listeners of the Facebook bleh, listeners of Dev Robot Society Facebook group. That's twice I've screwed that up today, um, as well as on the Patreon site about two things. Right? We have two live shows scheduled. Uh, the dates are posted there. And uh, um, in addition to that, we're also going to do a brainstorming episode. So what we have done is we have put those comments up there or the posts up there. And if you have an idea you would like to be brainstormed or you're having a problem with a novel, put the synopsis there. And what we will do is in a week or two, I will put up a poll where everybody gets to vote on which episode or what, what book they would love to see work. You know, I keep some, wanting to say workshop. Which book they would like to have us uh, brainstorm? So, Shelly Gator and NATO. Shut up. Uh, so make sure you you put your ideas there and please limit the post one per person. Otherwise, it's going to be a nightmare for us as well as everybody else in the universe. So one post per person, please. But those are the two upcoming things you should know about. With that in mind, it is time to witness the insanity that was recorded on a Sunday. <laughs> Yup. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so let's get into it. <laughs> Terry, what do you, weapon do yes, you Paul. use to kill plot bunnies? What in the hell? <laughs> <laughs> it's something my wife got me. It's a little cat statuette with a little light hanging off of its tail. Oh my. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> I've got two of them. I have absolutely no idea what to do with them, but they look cute. They look cute. Yeah. Well, unlike you. So true. <laughs> all right. Let me rephrase the question. I guess, first of all, what is a plot bunny, Terry? A plot bunny for me is something that, you know, you veer off. Of course, it's like the, the proverbial dog and the squirrel where you go squirrel. <laughs> And suddenly you're off in the left hand, going left into left field, chasing something, and the reader's going. <laughs> Is this relevant? <laughs> Is this really relevant? <clears throat> and and then which uh, I've had at least one reviewer say so far. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> well, how how do you know if you have a plot bunny? If you're writing about something and your characters are pursuing goal X and you suddenly discover that they're veering off on some wild tangent that you're really not quite sure how it connects back to the main plot, you may have a plot bunny. You may have a plot bunny. 
or you may have a glut bunny. Or if it goes nowhere and introduces no new relevant information, then it is definitely a plot bunny. In those cases, when you when you found you you've written something and this offshoot kind of just circles out and then comes back to your plot, that may be something to excise. <laughs> And I know some writers that do that when they, they, they write by the seat of their pants. And so they occasionally find themselves wandering far afield. And when they come back, they realize that that loop had nothing that really added to the story. And so they just cut it out wholesale. Right. And this is, this is where things get interesting because that that's, that's a plot money, but then there's also the plot money that is the result of characterization. So the, in literature, for instance, why are you doing that? In literature, for instance, you may have a scene, and, and all books do this to a certain degree. You'll have a scene where a character is doing something boring, and you'll want them to remember something and analyze it so you get a better idea of who we're talking about, what this person is. And you can do that through flashbacks. You can do that through whatever you want to do, whatever, whatever uh, um, tool you want to use to get that across. And sometimes those things can have bearing, but they may not seem like it at the time. But they do give you an idea of how that character interacts with things. While I was writing QPD, I had the uh, the protagonist start out being very angry at um, a certain group of people, but he does make some statement. You know, they were hard, fair, but hard. So it kind of gives you the idea that he understands that he fucked up to get himself in the situation that he's in, but the way they did it is what pissed him off. Um, so you get an idea that, yes, he thinks he's culpable too for whatever they accused him of, which um, I haven't revealed yet. But that kind of, it, 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 it gets better than just having somebody say, you know, I was wrong, you know, be the martyr and everything else and then realize or not admit you know, any, anything was their fault because I like characters to take responsibility. Um, I like people to take responsibility. So it's, it's, uh, I, I like doing that, but it seems so it, not irrelevant to what's going on at the time, but it's necessary to set up the relationships that are coming as well as some of the conflicts that are coming, but it doesn't necessarily seem relevant at the time. And you have to take those little breaks, I think, to, get the the reader to better understand and identify with your character um those kinds of moments are few and far between in action movies usually i'm gonna put that usually never never ever ever except sometimes make a you know generalization like that anyway the uh um that's gonna go on my tombstone <laughs> those, those moments i'd like to specifically tell you never to make generalizations <laughs> exactly <laughs> Yeah, from from the Ministry of Silly Walks. So the, the I, I think those moments are are very important because that's where we get the the love of the characters. I think if you go and you look at the characters you love the most, um, Dresden comes to mind. He has a lot of those moments where he stops, he's doing something, he's thinking about something else, and it goes off in this on the on what seems like a tangent, but then it comes back because uh, Butcher or Dresden wants to wants the reader to know that this happened and it meant something and it's okay for the character just like people in real life it's okay to not know what it meant but it keeps sticking with you the good thing about characters is you can then have them figure it out whereas people sometimes wander for decades without figuring it out so it, it it's just i think those moments are important and they shouldn't be excised or treated as as uh, viciously in your editing as as plot bunnies because they are two different things. What I was smirking about was I was remembering years back when I was a, a game master and role-playing gamer in the army and how as a game master, you'd go ahead and you'd put out this, this massive plot that the, the characters are going to follow and they're going to go here and they're going to do these things. And then they would fixate on some minor NPC and insist on going some 90 degree course off into La La Land. You're like, what are you doing? <laughs> Where are you going? And then you'd have to make up things on the fly to try to reorient yourself and either drag them back to the plot or just toss your plot aside and go on with something that they're doing because 
it's actually about the players, not the game master. That is correct. So, I mean, that, that, that goes back to the old army saying no battle plan um, lasts or, or survives. No plan survives contact with the enemy. There we go. Thank you. I could have said it less succinctly, but that's the right way to say it. Yes, exactly that. So it and and that's that's the other thing with outlines. Um, and I'll outline a few chapters ahead. I'll outline this, or I may have the idea for the entire book in my head. How it turns out ain't going to be that, because I will discover more shit along the way, and then end up writing five or six books. <laughs> so proud. Shut up. I don't need that kind of abuse from you or encouragement for that matter. You're not helping, Terry. I'm a contrary, my friend. You're, I believe I am. You're not helping. Uh, now you got me. You got me so confused. I'm writing 135,000 word novels now. Hey, don't blame me for long novels. That's not my perversion. No, no. I, I blame you because of what you've done to me. I, that's, I blame you for this. No. What you blame me for is all the books that you're writing in a series that you figured were going to be standalones. Yeah, that's another problem I don't even want to talk about. My next conversion for you is open series. We're going to get you there, buddy. We're going to make it happen. Um, Soul and Beyond is an open universe. I feel so proud. It was designed that way from the beginning. So was Garaga. That's true. Garaga was indeed. So I, I don't like those kinds of constraints. I want to say, fuck it. So anyway, what else with plot bunnies? How do you, how do you take how, okay, maybe there's something inside that thread, that plot bunny, that, that wide circle that goes out. What do you learn from that? Is there anything you should look for in there that maybe you can take back into the main plot or actually append to the plot or is, 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 is are plot bunnies just unfixable and should just be thrown away? I don't think that they're unfixable and should be thrown away. I think that if you think you've wandered far afield or you're going after something that's off topic. You should look, is there something that's making the character grow? Is there something that's changing the character in a way that that's, fits the story that you're telling? Do they find something that's appropriate to the plot? If you don't grow and you don't have anything that's appropriate to the plot, it should be excised. If you do, then there may be something salvageable there out of all those words you've written that you need to, to somehow get into your main plot if you decide to cut the rest. Hmm. Relevance is the key. Relevance is the key. Yes, I would agree with that statement. Maybe that needs to be the uh, the name of the uh, the episode right there. Relevance is key. Plot bunnies are fun because they allow you to do really crazy stuff. And in in and this has happened multiple times now, where my where my editor will grab onto a piece of stuff and put a comment in there. Yank this, but save it. This doesn't belong here. It's in another book. You know, things like that. And and that's when it's fun because you know that you're going to come back to that because whatever it was, it was working. It just wasn't working for this book. I mean, I, I've had characters where I put them in there. I have a lot of fun with them and I realize they're in the wrong book. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things about the book that I just finished, the Terra Gambit, is a couple of chapters into writing it, I had a plot bunny that took up about half the book <laughs> and is still there. It's still there Did the entire book become the plot bunny. No, but it certainly set the course of what the characters were going to be doing into a new light and onto a new track. And I put it there and I left it because it's going to have impact further on in the series. Okay. And, I need to have that change in there. And it's not something I could introduce with just a chapter or two. It actually required 10 chapters to sort out the implications of this major change that I put in this book. I foreshadowed it a couple of books back. I foreshadowed that this was a possibility. Something like this might occur, but still some people are going to see it as jumping the shark and it, it being totally unrelated and irrelevant to the story that I'm trying to tell. And those people are going to one star me. <laughs> I guarantee it. <laughs> one has already done so. <laughs> you too can join the one star club. A man is not judged by the quality of his friends, but by the quality of his one star Star reviews. <laughs> by the vitriol expressed in those one star reviews. 
In fact, you know what? If you were really, really super cool, like Jake Bible, Jake, do this. Uh, you need, you really need to do this, Jake. I'm, I'm remind, I'm saying this out loud, so I remember while I'm editing this episode. Jake, Mr. Jake Bible, please collect all of your nastiest, most horrible, awful one star reviews and put them together. I think basically what should happen is you put out an ebook every year for free of my god awful reviews. <laughs> I'm not sure you can do that because the copyright for those is actually owned, I believe, by Amazon. I believe they claim ownership of the reviews that you have left. Are you serious? Even if they don't, even if it was an individual doing it, they still have the the copyright to their own words. There Probably. may be there may be implications there that that perhaps that's not a great idea. Hmm. Yeah, but here's the deal. If that was the case, you could never use anything written in a review as a blurb for your book. That's why I don't. Hmm. Interesting. Well, God damn it, just blow another good idea all the hell. Thanks. I'm sure that somebody can tell me if I'm wrong. Tell, tell us if we're wrong about that. But I believe that there are copyright implications that one should be careful with that sort of thing. Oh, just take screenshots. Put the screenshots in there. <laughs> Just post links. Check this out. Post links. <laughs> Check this out. <laughs> Myhorriblereviews.com. <laughs> you too can be savaged by the general public. <laughs> For no good goddamn reason other than they hadn't had their coffee that morning. My wife tells me that I've got a serial reviewer. I don't read my reviews, so I don't know for sure. But she says, every book like clockwork, I've got some guy that comes along and three stars me. Really? With no explanation. Or two stars me. With with a similar thing of, oh, this book, oh, blah, blah, crap, blah, blah, blah. It's book eight. Why are you still here? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? You're doing you, it wrong. You might be the problem. <laughs> if you're eight books in and you're still reading and hating it, you have a problem. <laughs> but there are some like that. If I, I'm told that if you go look through my reviews and look at some of the ones that are on the negative side, that there's a serial reviewer or two that are out there that apparently just go by giving you terrible reviews, book after book after, after book. book. <laughs> I had no idea that was a thing, but apparently it is. I'm not the only one that has this no, problem. No, you're not. I talked to some other authors that there's one in particular, a reviewer in particular, that has hit just a bunch of them. And he just continues to hit them. Once he's got you, he keeps coming back every single book. I think he must live in somebody's basement. <laughs> Pretty sure something's going on there. Make that a plot element for one of your books coming up. The guy that lives in his basement, one starring authors. <laughs> Uh, there's a horror novel in itself. I, I can have some things happen to that person. I need to, if I ever make it big like Stephen King, I'll hire somebody to hack around and figure out who these guys are, and I'll go to their house like Jay and Silent Bob and beat them. Are you are you so and so and so and so who wrote blah 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 blah? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's like the greatest scene of all time. Where they go get they go get all those awesome. people. It's hilarious. And then there's a the kid. They didn't stop either. They just beat the kid up. That was pretty awesome. He just yanked him out and started beating the shit. <laughs> yeah, that was a pretty awesome scene. I agree. I've, I've, I seriously have considered. I, I, I have a notebook now that I write down my plot ideas in, even if it's not something that I think I'll ever use, because if I don't write it down, I'll never remember it. Yeah. yeah. And I wrote down one about a, a contract killer, a hitman, that somebody stole his identity and spent some of his money and he was going to go ahead and hire a black hat hacker to track these people down so he could go down and execute them. Hmm. Hmm. And I, I don't know how that would tie into anything that I do, but I could just totally see a detective in a mystery novel trying to figure that out or write it from the perspective of the hitman, yeah. try to, to figure out who these people are so they could go execute them. Yeah, and then he finds out it's the very people he's hired to find the people that did it. <laughs> yeah, it could very well be. There, there's a story in there somewhere. It's an incomplete story idea, but I wrote down the thread of it because it may become useful at some point when I'm yeah. looking to mash two or three things together. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love that that idea. That's the kind of thing I would write. Feel free. Knock yourself out. Yeah. <laughs> 
So plot bunnies can be good. Plot bunnies can be bad, but they're going to happen. No matter what you try to do, <laughs> even if you outline religiously, if you write 10,000 words of outline and you follow it religiously, you're going to introduce elements that don't necessarily add to the story. Unless you, you can't help it. Ridiculously anal. Or, or ridiculously unless, you're James, unless you're James Patterson, then you'll have somebody else introduce the plot bunnies. Right. Or ridiculously formulaic, which I think also applies in his case. But anyway, um, mm, mm, yeah, never mind. Uh, shut my mouth. So along with plot bunnies, we have their distant cousins, loose threads. So what's the difference between a plot bunny and a loose thread? I would say a loose thread is a plot point that dead ends. Mm -hmm. But it dead, dead ends not because necessarily you've forgotten about it, but because it's a thread, you're, it's something you're going to take up later. So you leave it in a certain state of, um, oh, what do you call it? Uh, limbo? Yeah, limbo is not the right word, but it's close enough. You leave it in limbo and just kind of move on. Um, like a there, stasis sort of thing. You leave it are, hanging there. There are things I've done in the black and also in derelict where and in and, and Gare's Inferno um, and Damon Zagaraga and Legends of Zagaraga. I left them. I got plot threads all over the place. There are these landmines that basically I say they're there and I may draw. I'll draw your eye to them. I'll draw the reader to them. And then we'll slowly peel away from it. And I just leave it there. And sometimes it is just a character noticing something. But then they get um, sidetracked by something else. But the reader sees that. And the reader says, wait a minute. That was really interesting. Why, why aren't we going back to that? And you just keep going. And you can ignore it and not come back to it. You can have these little mysteries that just get unsolved and then get solved in the next book or two or three books down the line. The bottom line is like the plot for Derelict, get to Mira, tow it back. Can't tow it out. Can't tow it back. Destroy it. Go back to Neptune. That's the mission. That's what we do. That's what the, the, the first three books are about. However, <laughs> they have discovered all of these mysteries and they've discovered that they've discovered the mysteries by finding out about them. That doesn't necessarily mean they have, have solved them. Now they know what they're looking for, but they have no solutions to any of those things. There's no explanations. They only know what has happened. They don't know why. And so now they're going to have to go in the next book and start that investigation process while dealing with the fallout of, of what happened in the first three books. So it's it's it uh, live leave those threads hanging because I know I'm going to take them up later, but you can do it the wrong way, which is to put a loose plot thread there and never do anything with it at all. I am unsure if that's the wrong way, because I've got a a file that's associated with Empire of Bones that I list out the various plot threads that I know that I've left hanging. Mm -hmm. And it takes up a couple of pages, right? Of but things that I've left hanging intentionally and not intentionally. But when you hang something, okay, when, when you leave a plot thread hanging, it's actually a, another piece of thread and it's just not sticking out from there. It's got a loop to it. It's got some slack. Yeah. That that's a big difference between that and then having it run into a wall. So it's just a nub. The, the key with these, rather than it running into the wall, rather than running into the wall, they're just unresolved. Yeah, they're unresolved. They're that's unresolved the word I was issues. For. That's, the, that's the word I was looking for okay. before. And I've got a ton of unresolved issues. Some of them I didn't even see until some of my beta readers got back to me and said, yeah, about this thing, you can sure take that up later. And I'm like, never even thought about that. It's just something I put in there. And now it's something that I've made a note about that I may or may not eventually come back and pick up that thread and make it go somewhere. And there's a plenty of them that are going to stay there and never be addressed. Sure. Absolutely. If you're writing a mystery, those are good things because one of the keys, somebody asked me once, how do you write a mystery and keep the reader guessing about the guilty party? And I said, the answer is you make everyone look guilty. <laughs> you don't, my solution as a, as a, 
as someone that has written some mysteries in the past, is I put out evidence that makes everyone guilty, and I don't select the actual guilty party until almost the end of the book. <laughs> and, 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 the, and, and the first part of you said about that, that's exactly what Agatha Christie does. That's exactly what she did. That's, that's exactly what uh, Sue Grafton and some of these other folks do. And, and even the cozy mysteries, the same deal. They make everyone look culpable. Everybody there is a suspect. That's the whole point. No matter. And, and, and of course, the star suspect is usually the one everybody thinks it's going to be. And so that's the person that never is. <laughs> Occasionally, it is the person. Occasionally, that it is, and I, that can I, be an element. Um, there was a, a movie version of one of one of Tony Hillerman's novels, which are set on a Navajo reservation. Joe Lee Porn and I forget who the other character is are uh, tribal police detectives. Right. Yeah, and you talked about these books before. In one of the movies of this, I, I don't know that I ever read the book. They come across a scene with a burning car and a dead body and a drunk suspect. <laughs> and they wander through this this mystery, finding things that point at everyone that they come into contact with, the things that everyone has done that could make them the killer and make them guilty of something. And they wind their way back around to the beginning, and it was actually the guy that they saw the very first scene did it exactly the way they they originally portrayed it in the novel. And right. he was guilty. <laughs> he did it. <laughs> but did that turn them into Keystone cops, or did they just feel like at that at the end? What it, what the way that it was portrayed by the author was, there was enough doubt in there. People, were, the detectives were like, you know, I'm just not sure that we're seeing everything about this. So they kept digging and they kept finding dirt on the people around this in the periphery. They never stopped looking at the character that 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 was guilty, but they, they just. just it just the expanded. They waited in the field, and then suddenly they weren't sure which of the Stooges were guilty. <laughs> and it wasn't until they sorted out what each person was guilty of, they were all guilty of something, that they figured out, yeah, that original guy was just exactly what we saw the first night. Damn it. <laughs> and that's how the characters felt. Damn I've it. also seen this done, and, and I'm kind of pissed because it doesn't look like they're ever going to make any any more movies about it. But um, the uh, uh, there was a Sigourney Weaver movie in the '90s uh, where she's a uh, serial killer profile, like profiler. I can't remember the name of it. She had suffers from agoraphobia and all sorts of nonsense. Um, but it turns out there's a conspiracy that you you kind of get to suspect. At some point, you just don't know how broad it is until you get to the to the end and they never take it up and they have never taken it up again in any of the movies. And it's a really fascinating idea, which is, uh, you know, I think I think in some ways the uh, TV series, the following kind of kind of ripped from this, which is the idea of you've got a psychopath, um, any social psychopath sitting behind bars. And they've just been convicted of murder. They've not been found mentally incompetent. They're not in a mental hospital. They're in a prison. And what are they doing? They're running a network of serial killers throughout the United States from their prison cell. Everyone needs a hobby. Everyone needs a hobby. So it's a very fascinating, um, a very fascinating idea. And and I'm I'm really pissed they never took it back up because I wanted to see those characters again. But you know whatever. You mentioned uh, Sue Grafton earlier. She died a couple of months ago, yes. sadly, before she finished her Z novel. So now there's there's only going to be 25 novels because no one is going to pick that one up. Her, she requested that no movies ever be made and no one ghostwrite her book. Hmm. So sadly, Z will never happen. Just like Robert Jordan didn't quite make it to the end. Didn't Sanderson end up writing two books to finish off Wheel of Time? I think I he know, did. I know he I think wrote he had one, to, but I think he had ended no, up. No, he had to, to break it two. into two, but that may be because Brandon Sanderson doesn't understand anything below half a million words. <laughs> <laughs> I know for a fact that's not true because I've read one. I'm just being a jerk. One of YAs, but still, that's pretty damn close to the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Recently, I'm looking at everything on there, just like. I looked at one of his most recent books and Four it was like 49 us. hours. His audiobook was 49 <laughs> hours. His narrator loathes him. 
Noah's narrator loves him because of how much they're getting paid per hour to turn and that now stuff I'm on. I'm going to continue narrating the same character for what feels like an eternity because it is an eternity. Welcome to my world. <laughs> That's your own personal problem. <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like Brandon Sanderson's ever going to hear that that I'm trash talking him. Well, this it's, is true. It's pretty funny. I, you know, don't the, 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 the funny. I got shit yesterday uh, on my dad's birthday. I went, went to lunch with them. They, they started giving me shit at the table that uh, um, my books are too short. It's always too short. And I just had to shake my head and just you know almost face palm. It's like, yeah, you know those folks you like that uh, write the five and six hundred word novel or a uh, thousand novels. 600 page novels they're getting advances i need to eat <laughs> i can't write that cut that size book and 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 it take me at least a year to write something that big now i'm looking at brandon sanderson because i just want to know how long his longest book is <laughs> i've got to know i think it's like 1100 pages well i'm, I'm looking at the audio version i want to know wow. the hours here Sort by running time. Here we go. His longest one on Audible. Woohoo! Oathbringer, 55 hours. Wow. That's that's pretty long. It was the one before it that was 48 hours. That's the Way of Kings or whatever it is. Uh, it's in the same series. It was Words of Radiance. Uh, Way of Kings was 45 hours. So it's only getting longer. <laughs> How long before he hits a 100-hour novel? Oh. Tell me his narrator doesn't hate him. Oh. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I would get sick of doing that. Like I know I would get sick of doing that. Well, just wait. You know, if he ever makes a bundle of those first three, I can go ahead and make it our assignment to read to listen to 200 hours of Brandon Sanderson. And I can always say no. <laughs> I can always give you the patented Cooley response, which is go fuck, fuck yourself. You. <laughs> <laughs> what a great idea you had, Terry. You go do that. <laughs> well, no, I meant for us. No, no, you go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to stand back here and go fuck no. I actually have the Way of Kings in my Audible library. I haven't found the 45 hours I need to listen to it yet. That's a long ass time. That is a long, well, I mean, I'm, I'm still trying to get through Pandora's star and that's only, only, uh, 35 hours. Still trying to get through it. You'll get your, you'll get your Mount Everest badge when you listen to the one that's over 24 hours. Oh God. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> that's so sad. <laughs> what? You're not a badge collector on there? No, I have no idea. I haven't looked. I it's on their. Know. I see it on their mobile app when I when I go through there. No. There's badges. I think I've gotten a few of those before. I probably have several of them, but uh, I I haven't looked at them forever. So threads are good. Threads are wonderful. Threads are are bread and butter in a lot of ways, because if you go and you look at movies, um, especially the ones that have been turned into series or TV series in general. Those threads are what what give us longevity. Those threads are what make characters interesting because in this book we might find out about more about this secondary character that everybody loves. In the next book we may find out things about another tertiary character that has slipped in some of the books and now becomes a secondary character. You get the opportunity to explore all these different things if you leave those threads there and don't resolve them. But you cannot have a thread in my in my humble opinion you cannot have a thread that is absolutely central to the plot not get resolved in some fashion maybe that's just me but that's the way i look at it the main plot thread has got to be resolved yeah that's that's the key to any any story that's one of the risks i had with writing this most recent book is they knew where the characters were headed out when they started the book, but the things I introduced changed the course. I resolved some of what they were looking for, but they never actually reached what they thought they were headed for that first thing because I changed the plot on them. My right. plot complications didn't allow them to overcome what they were looking for 
it's actually going to have to happen in a future book because I introduced too many new plot complications for them. Mm. Yeah. That's and I'm sure that's going to not be satisfying to some people as well. Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't want to write a 150,000 word novel. Wuss. I am not the only author that has split up a book because it did not make sense to write a doorstop. Don't give me the shock face. I have no idea who you're talking about. I'm I have talking about no you. idea I am talking what you're about talking about. You, Mr. Man. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. I I wrote the book out and I as I was getting past all the various complications. I saw that I was already approaching 80,000 words. The end, of, the end book was 86,000 words. And I had so much that I wanted to do that would have to go in there to wrap up the original plot that I had to pick a place to stop. Yeah. Yeah. It sucks. It sucks. So I'm, I will catch hell for that. Some readers will not be pleased yeah. that I did not resolve what they were doing. In fact, I didn't even resolve really any of the things that I introduced in this book. Basically, I just screwed the characters over. So it's three a, or four times. You, you describe this one as a as a bridge novel. It's pretty much a bridge novel. <sighs> my wife says it's my two towers. Your two towers. I think derelict saga books one through three are my two towers compared to all the rest of the shit that's going to go on. Um, it's it's hard. Once you start, I, I could have said, you know, screw it. I'll take out all the things that I'm introducing, but they are critical to future plot lines. Mm. They deserve to have the time and be introduced. And things just didn't work out the way the characters had hoped. I left them pretty well screwed over. Now they're going to have to overcome. I've never done that. I don't, I don't, I don't leave my characters in deep freeze while I, you know, finish the next book. That never happens. Of course, the fact that I'm not coming back to this book the next time I come back to Empire, that's going to leave people hanging a bit. That's going to piss people off. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to go back to Princess Kelsey. Princess Kelsey needs to be given her time. That's a that's a hazard when you take a pairing of major characters and split them apart. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I mean, that, that's one of the things that made Dara look so difficult is I had a I couldn't make the book just about Callie Mora and her squad going through Mira. I also needed to have all this other stuff going on, on, uh, on black. And there's a lot of characters to cover. So, cause I, I put all these characters in there and I wanted to spend time with a lot of them. So, you know, you end up in this mess, but I mean, if, if I wanted to make, if I wanted to, if I had wanted to simplify Mira or excuse me, um, the derelict saga, it could have maybe all bell been squashed into a one, 130,000, uh, word book. If I'd only gone with two characters, maybe I typically have four or five characters that are point of view in my novels. Sometimes that feels like too many. Sometimes it is too many. Sometimes it is too. It depends on what the characters are doing. Um, if I've got, um, like, uh, uh let's see, gears inferno really only has four points of view. Um, and really, really only three, really only three. Um, cause the fourth point of view isn't in there much at all. I think it's maybe a thousand words. So it's really just three points of view. That was all it needed. The reason why I, did, I never really told things from Brett's point of view is because it was unnecessary. It just didn't, it, it wouldn't have added anything to the story. It would have added a lot to the character. It didn't add anything to the story. And he wasn't the focus of that book. So I wanted to make it more about getting Dewhurst in front of everybody again because I want them to be prepared for when he shows up in another book. Because if they like that character, then the, men, the moment I mention his name on the back cover of one of these other books, they're going to be like, oh, I know these characters. And they're kind of cool. So they jump back into the book, regardless of what it's about. But I like those characters. So I'm going to keep popping them in and out of story. This is this is Tony Downs' uh, second... His second time as a, uh, um, a cameo. Dewhurst has had two cameos. Actually, this is Tony's third. Third cameo. So, uh, Tattoo, Closet Treats, and Gares Inferno. And the same thing with Dewhurst, Tattoo, and, and Gares. Or Tattoo and Closet Treats. And Gares. He's been all three. So, yeah. 
I think those are those are fun things to have. But sometimes you just gotta kind of if a story's really intimate, I don't think you need more than more than two characters or one character. It's I've certainly a, I've had char- I've had books that have only had one character, one point of view. I've the original Empire of Bones only had two characters that were alternating that were points of view. Wow. It was just Jared and Kelsey. That's it. Wow. Holy crap. That's mm. all I needed at that point in time. Since then, like, I've I've added people in. Yeah, uh, I've, I've occasionally. It's usually not the same people. I'll usually have one or two people added in, and it may not be the same characters as the last book. You'll have Jerry, Kelsey, and one or two other people. Because and special, and special guest stars. Exactly. So, I wanted to leave some room to expand other plot lines because having secondary characters that are point of view allows me to eliminate things that are going on that the main characters can't see that are right. that they're not present for. Right. And rather than having it take place off stage, I like to have a secondary character that I can involve. Right. Yeah. And that makes sense. I mean, it, it, it's just, you know, something that uh, you, you you need to really think about when you're writing these books is figuring out how many characters do you need? If you're a complete pantser, you'll discover that. But if you've got a good image in your head of who these people are or what's going to happen, then maybe that's going to already dictate how many characters you have, at least to start with. But, um, you know, it, it, I think it just kind of depends. And there's no hard and fast rules in here. It depends on what you're writing. Mm-hmm. It depends on what you're going for. It depends on what you want to do. It's your damn book. You decide. But I, I definitely think that five is pushing it. Six is too many. I think four <laughs> for me is a good number. I think I've come across 22 characters, fully realized characters in Pandora Star so far. 22 and we're only 12 hours into the book. Some people are better at it than me. It's a lot. No, it's a lot of people to keep track of, man. It is a lot of fucking people to keep track of. And I get lost. I get lost. That's the only problem I've got with Peter of Hamilton and these huge casts is it gets very easy to, to just get lost with them. So I think I'm, I'm capping my characters to about five. I think that's what I'm capping with. And that's why the black is so intimidating because now I've got people who survived all three incidents. And actually, if you go look, that's quite a, that's actually quite a number. Are they going to go ahead and get a t-shirt? I survived the black. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> I, I would they, love, they could be eaten in their t-shirt then. I, I think it'd be absolutely hilarious. If, uh, uh, uh one of the, the Fiendlings put together a t-shirt that says I survived him too. That would be awesome. I think in the next time, when you finally get back to writing the black, you need to make sure and have the monster kill somebody wearing a shirt that says, I survived X, whatever X is. (laughs) (laughs) Oh God, those moments are just so bad. Or have a t-shirt that says something like, I hate horror movies. (laughs) Have the monster eat him. You can come up with a pithy t-shirt of some kind to have him no, wearing. Just, somebody's wearing a have a nice day shirt just to get torn apart. All that's left is basically the bloody torso with the smiley face with on the it. smiley face. You're a sick man, Paul Cooley. Oh, whatever, man. Whatever. Whatever. If you weren't, <laughs> such a, if you weren't so squeamish, you could make great money in horror. No doubt. I've got a sense of humor that would be really oh, weird. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's what Ed Lorne does is his sense of humor is warped as hell. And that's, that's why he's able to write the books he's able to. And they, and they're riveting in a lot of ways. And you're sitting there going, Oh, come on, Ed. And then you read them more and you're like, okay, that worked. <laughs> I'll just keep feeding you my horror ideas and you can just keep jotting them down. <sighs> yeah. It's my job. It's my lot in life. It's what I do. It's what I'm here for. Or something. So, what are you what are you looking at? You, you've got this next book, or the, the next part of your series has got all these divergent um, threads. So, you, are you literally just going to write a book about each of these threads that you started in this book? No, undoubtedly not. the The threads that started in this book, the most major thread, which I'm not going to spoiler, is going to have long term implications in uh, this in the novels that are forthcoming because it's a game changer it's it changes the landscape that they're dealing with 
and it's going to be something they're going to have to adjust to. And I may do something in, in future novels that utilizes this change to give me a whole new direction to take some stories. Okay. Fair enough. And that's what I want to do with it. The other major thread in this book is one that they're going to have to complete in the next novel. And it's going to probably not work out the way they intended, but it's also going to open up new avenues for these stories. That one, however, will be closed off. They'll mm. finish that one. The other one is an open-ended sort of thread. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. I I just I I find it interesting when you hit this 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 point with this bridge novel. I'm 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 so far behind on the Empire Bones. I actually started I think the fifth one the other night. So much has happened. Yeah, I I I, I kind of get that feeling. So it's going to take me a while to get back into it, but I can't wait to see where things go from this bridge novel. I, I'm I'm personally sitting there waiting for Fonzie. You know, I'm I'm waiting to see the shark. If, if, yeah, the shark. I'm, I'm really I'm waiting, waiting for somebody to, to make that statement. I really am because I know it's going to happen. So somebody, what I I yeah, need to go get the, the animated GIF and and post that on your on your author page. <laughs> Rock on, buddy! <laughs> You've jumped the shark, <laughs> you douchebag! <laughs> Just put the Keanu Reeves GIF. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> I think the um the plot threads that I've talked about and, and derelict are gonna allow me to write books about Cali Mora on Mars. I'm gonna, they're gonna allow me to write about books about her on Titan, Titan Station. Um, I think they're gonna allow me to write books about Dickerson and uh his time in Dallas and Dallas Dome growing up there. I think there's a chance to write about the Mars Revolution that almost happened, the satellite war, the Scaparelli rebellion. All of these different things come out of this book, and I've mentioned all of these things. And so they're just sitting there waiting for me to take them up, and I want to take up every single one of them because they're Good luck fascinating. The time. <laughs> it, it, it's about finding the time. <laughs> And and I, I think that those those little moments that you discover while you're writing about these characters, I think you should. I would encourage you to to write those down when you come across them. That hey, your brain left this this idea here, and it's something that uh, you 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 might do well in picking up, or at least paying attention to it. I know that um, I'm going to use Glenn Stewart as an example of this. Don't do that. He's a terrible person. Oh no, it's awful how that works out. No, he um in his first starship, his first collection of of novellas, uh, the Starship's Mage stories that he put together, he introduced a character that now he's he's veered off and has a second ongoing series set inside the same universe with that other character that he's brought in a new supporting cast to gotcha. work around, and so. It's interesting how you can take the hooks that you leave and expand them in ways that'll support expanding the universe going forward. Yeah, and I think it's especially it's especially important if you are actually trying to create an open universe um, where where you have a lot more books happening in it than just the ones you're writing at that second. I think it's it's extremely important, and it's 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 fantastic. I mean, I, I love the idea of shared worlds and getting other authors into, into my mix. I just don't think I'm capable of handling it. Um, hopefully that will, that will fade at some point or I hire somebody to manage it because I sure as shit can't. So, uh, I am incapable. So the, uh, um, but I love the idea of handing some of those stories over and saying, I really want this book written, but I don't have freaking time. And then, you know, give give some writer that uh, you really respect and, and like, a, a, you know, a shot at helping you out with that. The key with something like that is if you're going to do it, you have to either have a good idea of where that story element has to go in order to dovetail into what you're writing yeah. or the ability to go ahead and handle what somebody else might introduce to your universe. Right. Their story may go a little afield of where you thought that element would lead. And then you're like, and I matter. How the hell do I put this in here? <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea of what you're doing now, which is he writes the first 20 K and the last 20 K and you're going to write the middle. 
we do have an outline, so I, I can't leave him hanging too far. I know well, where I roughly yeah. have to be heading for. <laughs> I think if I really trusted another writer, I think it would basically be going, here's how it starts, here's how it ends, figure out the stuff in between. And oh, by the way, you have to solve the following problems or introduce them. There you them. go. I think that's an excellent way to do it and, because and then, it lets you yeah. as the, the person holding on to the storyline that has to fit into your universe, you have a good idea of where it's going to end so it doesn't end up really far afield <laughs> so it doesn't end up you in thought a, you were getting. It doesn't end up in a aliens, seven books. I don't need aliens. I got to deal with this asshole for seven more books now? <laughs> Why are there aliens in here? Why, 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 why did this happen? Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I might try that at some point with something small and, um, it might happen. It, it very well might happen. I don't want to do it. Cause there's some, there's some other books I want to write that, that, uh, I, I just don't know if I can write them or have the time to write them. But I think like the Trident book that takes place between, um, the end of Mira and uh, when Black gets back to Neptune, I think that would be a really fascinating book to write. I just worry that it would spoil the Trident book. So I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do yet. I may just write it anyway and say, fuck it. Put it out there as a 60,000 or 50,000 word novella and say, Sever, do you want it? If not, 50,000 words is a novel. Anything above 40,000 words is technically a novel. We, we, well, well it, it was, hmm, hmm. Terry? Go fuck yourself. All right. No, so it's true. I didn't make up, up these shut rules. Up, shut up. Shut up. I don't want to hear it. I'm not even sure I'm capable of writing a short story anymore. I'm not even sure I'm capable of doing it. You're the you are the master of the epic short story. Yeah, the epic short story. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Sigler. Poor Sigler. I'm so sorry, Scott. I didn't mean to do it to you. It's um, a lie. He meant every single word. I just love that book. I love that book so much. I did not want to give up those characters. I just did not want to do it. I hated it. I wanted to write an entire goddamn season of Dynalition books. I wanted I wanted just bang, 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 bang. I set all this shit up and it's like, oh, oh, I can't do anything with it now. Anyway, I'm going to go cry in a corner. Um, it, I, I think that there's the, there are some things that, that uh, can be done, and I think maybe we need to investigate that. But as we've said before, if you don't have the story Bible together, you don't have this other shit together, it ain't. It's just going to turn into a mess. So get that you shit gotta together. you got to have a map so that you know where things are going. you yeah, got to have it. You can't. Uh, we'll talk about if, that some other point. If you still don't have an idea of where it's heading, you at least need to sit down with your potential co-writer and say, what are you thinking here? Try to yeah. get an idea of where yeah. things might lead and make sure there are at least general guidelines to get it <laughs> somewhere, <laughs> somewhere that will be helpful for your plot going forward. So you don't have to ride around the volcano. It's one thing to burn the map. It's another thing to blow up the world. <laughs> I needed to ride on this planet. I needed this planet for my next story. You cannot destroy <laughs> this planet. It was in the way of my view of Saturn. <laughs> the P-38 space modulator or whatever the hell it is. Yeah, it was, I was trying to remember that. Yeah, I think it was P-20. P I something. Yeah, we'll have to go look it up. <laughs> I love Marvin the Martian. He was one of my favorite Looney Tunes characters because he was just so whacked out there. But the Earth is in the way of my view of Saturn. What a douchebag. <laughs> Anybody wear that outfit? Ugh. Guy doesn't even have a face. So you got anything more to say about plot threads? It's a burden we all have to bear. <laughs> plot threads that end up being hanging. That is just the nature of writing. Here's plot the bunnies, on the other hand, exterminate the bunnies. Exterminate. One more question before we go. Or, or we, before we end this particular topic. Is there ever been a plot thread that you found or wrote in a short story that you ended up carrying into another short story or worked into a, a novel or a novella? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. So you're, I'm not the only one. No. Yay. That's good to hear. I wrote two stories for Charlie set in an alternate reality where there's magic. I wrote them in the 1920s and um, the same characters in both and some elements from the first short story, mostly his personality 
carried through to the second one. Awesome. I like that. The fact that he was a member of an order of mage assassins um, also carried through. It was a major plot element in the second one. Even though you never meet these shadowy figures that he works with, that was very critically important to the plot of the second short story. Right. Okay. In fact, it, if you get down right to it, uh, the short story would not have been what it was without that shadowy group lurking in the scenes that were never mentioned really. I, I urge everybody, um, if you're writing a story, pay attention to these kinds of things. It doesn't matter what's 500 words or 50,000 words or 3 million. Uh, of course, if you're writing books that size, uh, you don't need our help or you need some kind of help. You need some kind of help, but you're not going to get that from us. All we're going to do is say you're nuts, but that's because we are, 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 we haven't spread our, Terry hasn't spread his wings yet. But with only 3 million words, I've barely begun to expand upon the basis of my story. Oh my God. Oh, 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 oh. your pretension reminds me of some of the people I went to school with. <laughs> And the sad part is I was probably one of them. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> I, I was reading, I think well, here's, here's the offside here. I'm going off topic. There was a post wow. that uh, an author named SM Sterling was making about academics. I read a bunch of his alternate history. I love him as an author. He's a traditionally published author that has been around for a while. And he was talking about academics in his career, how, his initial education in literary works that the people that were in academia that he associated with at that point were brilliant people, very likable and utterly and completely useless. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my favorite line is in dangerous liaisons. Um, Glenn Close's character um, look, looks at John Malkovich and goes, and she goes, like most intellectuals, he's he's completely useless or no, no, he's utterly stupid is what she said. <laughs> it's like, well, you can put enough obstacles in front of him, may fall over and find himself in bed with her. <laughs> it's, it's like, I love that movie. The dialogue is awesome. If you've not seen that. Dangerous liaisons. John Malkovich, Michelle Pfeiffer, Keanu Reeves, uh, uh, John Malkovich and... He's in it twice. I That's said awesome. Malkovich twice. Shit. Um, Malkovich, Keanu. He should Reeves. be in it twice. That would be an awesome movie. Malkovich, Keanu Reeves, Glenn Close, Michelle Pfeiffer, and I for Uma Thurman, young Uma Thurman. Oh, it's awesome. Oh, great movie. Great, great movie. But no space blasters or anything else. No science fiction, except for how they do their hair in the 1700s. That was pretty scary. But uh, that's that's a whole nother deal. Anyway, I think we're done for today. <laughs> I believe we are. I'm punch drunk here. It's been a long weekend. All right. So we are going to close this up now. If you have something you would like to add to this discussion, take issue with, or you just want to comment on the epicness of Terry's beard, you can email us at show at DebRobotSociety.com. You can... Tweet me at Paul underscore E underscore Cooley, or you can join the listeners of the Dev Robot Society Facebook group where all the crazy happens, all the, 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 the conversations that are going on and, and everything else. It's been fun. We love it. it our, our group is wonderful. A lot of support there for you. So uh, um, if, if you use the, the uh, Facebook, get your butt over there. And uh, we also have to thank our wonderful host, Pod Hoster, who makes all 10 bazillion episodes of the Dev Robot Society podcast available for your ear holes. And you can also find us at youtube.com slash DRS podcast, uh, iTunes, whatever else. And where the hell else are we? Oh, yeah. If you like the show and you want to help keep us, yeah, help keep it commercial free, you can join us at patreon.com slash DRS podcast, where for just a few bucks a month, you can get access to exclusive content, live shows, and pretty soon workshop shows, if I remember correctly. Workshop shows. We're doing workshops. Well, well, uh, brainstorming episodes. Brainstorming. I remember that. I didn't remember the workshops. No, well, the workshops is later. We'll come up with that later. Surprise! I have, I, yeah, surprise! <laughs> On air, Paul tells everybody, oh yeah, Terry and I are giving a workshop next week. Terry's like... We are? <laughs> <laughs> no, we are not giving it a workshop next week. So anyway, if you want to help us out, youtube.com slash DRS podcast. And at the $10 level, 
you get your name said every single week. So our list of $10 patrons are Robert Slade, Devin Lee, Caleb James. Caleb, are you alive, man? The one, the only, Nathan Petty. Drew, it's Terry's fault, Bernardi. Boy, it, that's very true. John Kilgallen, Chris, Toy Boat, Toy Boat, Toy Boat, Toy Boat, Toy Boat Winder. Isabel pff, Cushy. <laughs> Andre Conde Marius, DJ Chamberlain, Jonathan Zarusen, and J.R. Hanley. Thank you, folks. Thank you very much, patrons. We appreciate it. And with that, I think I covered everything, didn't I? think so. I think I covered everything. Hopefully. There's probably something I missed. And with that, we will close out the show. Terry, been fun talking to you. It's been good, man. Everybody, thank you for listening and watching us. And uh, we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.